For Saw 6, a new director was brought onto the series, and just like all of his predecessors, Kevin Grutert was a first-time director. Though he did have experience with the franchise, having edited movies 1 through 5. On his title card, there's some flashing effect going on with the letters VI, highlighting the Roman numerals for the sixth installment. There would be a lot of sixes that come up in this film, like the fact that John's instructions for his ex-wife come in six envelopes, the inclusion of six new traps, the dog pit, which was a group of six insurance policy inspectors, who were all tested in the carousel trap. And according to IMDb, the soundtrack, Zep 6, has a length of six minutes and is played in the background of the final six minute climax scene before the credits roll. Hard to say if that last one is really intentional, but even with all of the sixes found in this movie, there's an even more important seven. And I'm not talking about Mr. Feldman's line when he gives the box to Joe. Mr. Tuck, what's in the box? What's in the box? I'm talking about a new seven that hints to the audience that the next sequel will be the last of this saga, so stick around to the end of this video if you want to hear about it. Welcome to Things You Missed. I think Saw 6 is probably the most underrated movie in the franchise. We get to see Jigsaw explore some new territory, as the film makes a statement about the health insurance system in the United States. It was a topic of discussion in 2009 when Saw 6 came out, just five months before the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, was passed. And it may be an even bigger topic of discussion as I'm recording this video in the year 2020, as the world is going through the biggest global health threat of the past century. Many of the traps in Saw 6 are symbolic of the position that healthcare providers have to take when considering coverage for a client. There are also some disturbing things you may have missed outside of that, but I'm not allowed to say them until after the logo. That actually doesn't make sense, because I already said some things you missed at the beginning of this video. But our opening trap features a couple of malicious money lenders who planned to repossess more than their payees could ever pay back. And honestly, this one never made sense to me because it's completely unfair. The rules state that whoever offers the most flesh onto the scale will be the one to survive. And the woman, Simone, has considerably less flesh to give. She's at a disadvantage because she's healthy. As per Jigsaw's motto, she cherished her life more, and yet she's being punished for it? Still, if I was in the trap, I would have put on my clothes on the scale first. It's not like this movie isn't already rated R. We are then introduced to the Umbrella Health Company. I think this is less of a Resident Evil homage and more of a reference to the purpose of an umbrella to cover you, just as an insurance company offers coverage. But this company is very particular about who they're willing to cover, and has a team of policy inspectors checking up on people to make sure that they're at a low risk to actually get sick. They sit around a circular table in the middle of the office, whose shape resembles the carousel trap that they would eventually be placed on. This team is referred to as the Dog Pit, and the top dog is Dave, who has an award on his desk that says Terminator of the Month. This is obviously a reference to the termination of insurance plans, but looking back on it with more context gives it a darker meaning, where it seems to be about the termination of human life. Terminator strikes again! The boss, William Easton, works with his lawyer on a deposition about a man named Harold Abbott, the father of a family who would eventually give the final judgment of William. You remember dealing with a Mr. Harold Abbott? In his office, Mr. Easton has the news broadcasting on the television, where the anchor talks about the distribution of John Kramer's assets after his death. And she mentions that most of them were in real estate, which may lend more credibility to the nerve gas house theory that I mentioned in the last episode of Things You Missed. Also, the news station is WNKW News. If you lived in North America around the heyday of broadcast television, you may be familiar with the four character station IDs given to every television and radio station. All stations east of the Mississippi River were required to start with W. I've given plenty of evidence that the setting of the Saw movies is on the East Coast throughout this series, so this is just one more factor in favor of that idea. Another interesting aspect of this office is the fish tank full of piranha, which as far as I know are not a common pet, and are known for their predatory behavior. I think they're symbolic of this company. Piranha. Good job, John! You really know your fishies! After William's capture, he finds himself in the Mr. Creepypasta trap. Or maybe we should just call it the Preview of 2020 trap. His opponent is the janitor, Hank, a smoker who likely would not have been able to acquire health insurance according to Umbrella's policy. While only 52 years of age, this man has continued to smoke even though he has a history of high blood pressure and heart disease. We eventually come to find out that John chose Mr. Easton for his game because he once denied coverage for an experimental cancer treatment. Hank is the same age that John was when he died, and I feel like he was chosen to make a statement about the insurance company's power to, in a way, choose who lives and who dies. Also, this is the first time John shows himself on screen during the tapes where he explains the rules to his victims, and I think he did this to remind William of the face he once encountered when the two met at a party at
at Homeward Bound Clinic. It didn't matter that John was giving away his identity in this one because the instructions for this game were delivered to Jill in his will. In other words, the trial of William Easton could only take place after John's death. Which I think is fitting, because it makes William realize the message that Jigsaw is trying to convey, that because of his policy, the blood is figuratively on his hands. The trap asks its victims to use as little oxygen as possible. Whoever does that can avoid being crushed by this machine. They've both got the wrong idea here. In my experience with scuba diving, the best way to conserve air is to take slow, deep, continuous breaths. William's faith in his policy would be challenged again in the next trap, but first, there would be some interesting details of note in the past of Jill Tuck. After receiving the materials from John's will, Jill flashes back to some of the memorable moments of her marriage and its downfall. We see the grave of their unborn son, Gideon, which features an infinity icon, perhaps to symbolize John's belief in the idea of rebirth. He considers his test subjects to be reborn whenever they pass one of his traps. It's not entirely clear if the animals are connected to this in a circle of life kind of way, or if they could be connected to the location of his largest game, which takes place at an abandoned zoo. As far as horror movies that take place in zoos go? Pretty good track record. William Easton continues through his trial, where he's reminded of the party where he first met John Kramer. It would appear that Amanda, a former patient of the clinic, is also present at this party, wearing the same outfit she had on during the reverse bear trap scene in Saw 1, minus those detached sleeves. I guess Amanda doesn't have that many outfits, because in an earlier flashback, she has the same shirt she had on when she helped John set up the bathroom game in Saw 3, but you can tell by her hair that these things aren't taking place on the same day. The next section of the zoo game took place in what looks like a reptile habitat, and I have to wonder if Kevin Rutert saw that one jump scare the year before in The Dark Knight? Yeah, that one. And basically thought, you know what? We're gonna do that too. Just doesn't hit quite the same though. But I do like this trap because it forces William to make similar kind of life or death decisions to those made in his work, but it personalizes them by using his own employees. Does he kill a family woman nearing the end of her life or a healthy young man with no family? His insurance formula would have him cover the man rather than the woman, but in the heat of the moment, that's not what he decides. As you can see, the choice is not so clear when you are face to face with the people whose blood will stain your hands. We revisit the moment William's policy personally affected John, who had been seeking health coverage to undergo an experimental gene therapy for his cancer from a Norwegian doctor. He brings in a pamphlet where we can see the name of the doctor is Soren Popescu. That happens to be the same name of the first assistant art director, whose name was also seen on the box in the FBI headquarters in Saw 5. Since I always like to make up stories so that these easter eggs make sense in-universe, I'm gonna say that Dr. Popescu was on vacation visiting the US where he happened to be the victim of a crime. When John's coverage is denied, he goes on a rant about the empty promises of politicians who claim that health-related decisions should be made by doctors and patients. He motions to the clip playing on the TV screen, which is a quick shot of John McCain, who was a senator who ran for president in 2008. Now, I'm not gonna pretend like I know anything about politics, but from what I can gather, this guy opposed Obama's healthcare plan, which came out in 2009, the same year that Saw 6 was released. Obviously, the movie takes place in 2006, though, not long after Jigsaw's death, but I imagine that McCain already had his views about healthcare beforehand, so the meaning behind the clip is still relevant. Room number three is the steam maze, where William had to guide his lawyer through a dangerous labyrinth filled with vapors hot enough to leave a nasty burn. Come on man, just climb over the railing a little bit and pull the lever from an angle where you don't have to get burned. You ever played Crash Bandicoot? These steam things can totally be avoided. He also gets kicked in the balls and is fine two seconds later, but whatever. Let's go back to the FBI storyline. They figured out that there's an abnormality in Strom's fingerprints, which they found at the crime scene of the opening trap. Special Agent Perez shows Hoffman the screen with the analysis report, where we see Strom's name above a few others. Anthony Iani is a new name for us. He's the production designer on this movie. There are two other names that are not new. They're both first assistant art directors, but in the world of the movie, Sean Schofield is an FBI agent and possibly newspaper writer, and Soren, well, we just discussed Soren, the Norwegian doctor turned tourist crime victim. Someone's gotta make a Saw movie, or at least a comic or something, with all these easter egg characters as the main characters, just for my sake. As the game nears its end, Jill prepares her plan for its conclusion, and in her apartment, there are some photos of her and John, which seem to tell us the reason that she's still willing to help him. If she keeps those pictures up after their divorce, it would seem that there are still some feelings there. Also, how old 
old were they when they got married? I mean, the pictures are out of focus in the background there, but I mean, look at that hairline. This marriage seems like it might have been kind of recent. The biggest room of the zoo game features a large spiral on both the door and on the carousel itself. The spiral has been a symbol associated with both Jigsaw and Billy the Puppet from the very beginning, which will presumably be explored more in the ninth movie, Spiral. To match Mr. Easton's ratio where he rejects two-thirds of insurance applicants, Jigsaw asks him to kill off two-thirds of his application review team. The trap resembles a carnival ride. He uses Billy for the tape this time, rather than footage of himself. And with his white face paint and cheeky bow tie, Billy kind of does resemble a carny. Of all the Billy videotapes, this one might be the creepiest. Not sure what it is. The carnival music that comes in when the ride starts moving provides great contrast with the sheer horror of the scene. It brings out the worst in each employee because of their desperation to live. In the end, Mr. Easton goes full I-dubs and simps his staff down to two women. Meanwhile, the FBI has finished descrambling the tape from the pendulum trap scene in the last movie, and they invite Hoffman to see the results. Detective Hoffman has no choice but to go with Erickson and Perez to see the results of the voice descramble. Now as an audio professional, I don't think that's a thing you can do. The Jigsaw voice is made by layering together audio with various pitches, so the FBI could analyze different frequencies, frequencies but, but they'd they have, have no, no way, way of, of knowing, knowing which, which one was the original, original voice. voice. Now normally I don't talk about mistakes and just accept the fact that it's a movie, but I mean come on, this movie is directed by an editor, he should have caught that. But despite all of that, I think this is probably actually my favorite scene in the Saw franchise, and at the end of it, Hoffman Hoffman is going to his car after taking out three agents. And we see this prop, which looks like one of those chattering teeth gags. I don't know why this would be here inside of this computer lab if not to foreshadow the upcoming scene. This is essentially someone's jaw, and I think it's a sign that Hoffman's jaw is about to get damaged in the reverse bear trap 2.0. But before heading back to the zoo for the last part of William's trial, Hoffman goes back into the lab. Where Special Agent Erickson is still alive and covers him in gasoline. Brutal! Just brutal! Brutality! When William makes it to the final room, he sees his sister, Pamela, the Jigsaw reporter condemned for her sensationalist writing. But his life ends up in the hands of the family of Frank Abbott, the man who died as a result of Umbrella Health terminating his insurance plan on a technicality. One, two, So far, this is the only Saw movie to have a post credit scene where we see Amanda circa Saw 3 delivering a message to Corbett Denlin. Don't trust the one who saves you. I've seen the scene criticized in the past because we never specifically see what comes of it. In Saw 5, Corbett was rescued by Hoffman and taken to safety, and we never see her again after that. At least, not that we know of. So what was the meaning of this scene? I think the implication here is that after saving Corbett, she told Agent Perez that some woman warned her not to trust the one that saves her. So Perez was immediately suspicious of Hoffman. This is reflected in this line after Perez is badly injured by the exploding Billy the Puppet. She said your name, you know. Last thing she said was Detective Hoffman. Why'd she say that? Why'd she say your name? Then in Saw 6, Prez is revealed to have survived the attack, but even after supposedly determining that Strom was the second accomplice, Prez still doesn't look too happy to see Hoffman. I think it all goes back to Corbett's warning. I really don't see how else they would have had the idea to look back at what kind of knife was used to cut Seth Baxter's jigsaw piece, what kind of oil was left behind by Strom's fingerprints, or really any reason to doubt that one of the tapes was recorded by someone other than John. At the beginning of this video, I discussed the recurrence of the number 6, because this was the 6th movie. The original Saw Saga was released in consecutive years from 2004 to 2010, ending with Saw 7. Technically, Saw 3D, but I call it Saw 7. That was originally going to be the last movie, so it was given an alternate name, Saw the Final Chapter. Now in Saw 6, at the Umbrella Health Company, William Easton's desk is where all contract disputes come to an end. He even tells John when he comes in to plead his case about getting coverage for the gene therapy. Well, the buck stops here, John, fire away. So basically we're being told that whatever it is, it stops at Mr. Easton's desk. And on Mr. Easton's desk at all times is these dice, which add up to the number 7. Okay, big deal, there's some dice. They happen to add up to seven. There's seven movies. It's probably a coincidence, right? Well, I was gonna say the same thing But then I realized that no matter what angle no matter what scene in the movie the numbers facing the camera Always add up to seven which means someone had to specifically go in and move these dice every time the camera moves in order to keep this Consistent the buck stops here and the series stops at seven 
So make sure you join me for the next episode of Things You Missed, where I'm going to be covering the final chapter of the initial yearly Saw movies, Saw 7. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring that death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive. Piranha. Yes, very good, John. Very good.